Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to come into your presence this morning and we proclaim you as our creator and our sustainer and uh, our savior, uh, the one who worked all of human history around in order to bring Jesus here to be our savior, to die and to rise for us so that we might not only be with you in heaven, as glorious as that is, but that while we live here on earth, we can come to you in fullness and um, get to know you and, and bring our praises and our prayer requests to you. And so this morning we come thanking you for making that relationship with you available to us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who empowers us and enlivens us and uh, makes us fit for ministry, who encourages us, who comforts us when uh, we need comfort. We thank you, Lord, that for every need that we have, you are the provision. And so this morning we come to you and, and worship you and tell you that uh, life is good with you. No matter what we go through, life is good with you. And we praise you for your presence with us every moment of every day. We ask you this morning that as we come to study your word in Acts, that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear the things that you would have us to learn. <coughs> because we've come here, Lord, not just to learn facts, but to know you more deeply. We also ask you this morning uh, to bless each one of these that we have mentioned. Many of them, Lord, are sick, and we ask you for healing. There are others who have um, financial needs. We ask you to uh, work in those situations to um, bring restoration. Each one is unique, Lord, and has different needs. We ask you not just to bless them with things earthly like healing or money or whatever, but that you would draw them close to you, that they would realize your desire to bless them as they are dependent upon you. Use their difficulties as opportunities to bring them closer to you. So this morning, we ask your blessing upon us and all of them that we might be a blessing. Strengthen us by the power of your Spirit that we might be the people that you have called us to be. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, our great High Priest, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for all work having such a beautiful prayer. It well, makes the day so nice. Well, um, you know, uh, prayer is really important in the early church. We've, we've even seen it uh, here. I don't think we take time enough to really pray, and that's a short prayer. <laughs> um, but prayer is important. Well, I think we neglect prayer. I think we also neglect the Holy Spirit. And so I think we need to really be open to learning about the Holy Spirit. Um, I got a heavy dose yesterday. I, I went to my um, beautician, and she's a Pentecostal. <laughs> and so, <laughs> she told me that she could help me a lot. Um, and um, 
<laughs> I might know more about Pentecostal things than she knows, but um, you know, sometimes people come on pretty um, heavy, um, and it sort of turns people off. Sometimes she comes on a little heavy, um, but we do need. All, all joking aside about that, you know, we are the frozen chosen, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we need to loosen up a little bit, and we need to learn to yield to the power of the Holy Spirit. And we need to learn to do things in His strength and not in our own strength. And we need to learn to come up, and I say this corporately and I say this individually, we need to learn the process of listening to the Lord so that we're not asking the Lord to bless our plans, but we are seeking His plans. And His plans are not... One thing I've learned in my 65 plus years is that the Lord doesn't think like I think or like our society thinks or like we generally think. And so sometimes we have to step out of our boxes in order to know him. And so I'm encouraging you ladies that this is something that we all need to do. We need to pray about it. We need to spend more time in prayer, period. Just, you know, we're so busy. I'm sort of hoping it snows tomorrow. It's to telling Vicki. And I'll tell you why, because when it snows, you can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. You can't schedule anything. And you can be quiet and spend time with him. And uh, we, we need that. Um, and so, you know, this whole book of Acts is about the apostles as they were filled with the Spirit and how their lives were different from what they had been and how they literally turned the world upside down <coughs> these simple people these were not they hadn't been to the biggest schools they hadn't uh, gotten all the training and all that and you know um, I go to some of these church meetings and they have this method and that method and the other you know we just we need to listen to what he says and then we need to get out there when he says to in uncomfortable situations where we have to rely on him and Really and truly, um, I, I know there's controversy about this, and we're going to get to the lesson in just a minute, I promise you, after I've <laughs> said my spiel. But um, there's a lot of feeling, oh, we need to find out what our spiritual gifts are so that we can use them. Our spiritual gifts are not necessarily, and usually are not, our natural gifts. Because God wants us to get out there and do something that we naturally can, are not fit to do and so that we have to trust him to do it in us and I know y'all find this hard to believe but basically I'm kind of a shy person and the very when I was in high school and I had to give a book report I shook so hard that I could hardly even get the words out of my mouth And so God wants to take what's not necessarily natural to us and put us in an uncomfortable situation so that we learn. It's a growing process for us. We learn to depend upon his spirit. And so that, that's what I'm saying to you all. Is I really feel like we need to do that. And we need to know this third person of the Trinity we know a lot about God. We know God. We know a lot about God through Jesus because we can read and hear about <laughs> Jesus a lot. And, and that's the reason he came, so that we could relate to God because he came and he endured all the stuff that we have to endure, all the temptations, the trials, and whatever. Um, but the Holy Spirit is sort of mysterious. And uh, somebody was asking me the other day about the Trinity. And you know the best answer to that? It's a mystery. Because mm -hmm. it is. 
Um, so the Holy Spirit, we don't need to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you'll notice that that's the expression that's used over and over again. Now, we are <coughs> baptized in the Spirit one time. We have There's one baptism. And when we, uh, as um, Presbyterians, you know, we baptize people as infants. But the, the confirmation of that baptism is when they join the church. They, they call it confirmation when they're like 12, 12 years old if they go through the class and do it then. But sometimes people don't do it until they're much older, and that's fine too. Um, and we receive the Holy Spirit then. The only problem is, is that a lot of times in our culture, we understand a lot about Jesus and the forgiveness of sins and that's important we need to understand that that that's a part of becoming a Christian but the other part of becoming a Christian is that we not only have our sin question dealt with but once that's done then we may be filled with the Holy Spirit we can't be filled with the Holy Spirit until that's dealt with but we should receive the Holy Spirit and ask him in and live in the power of the Holy Spirit once we come into the church. But that doesn't always happen, does it? Because people what? They don't know about it. You know, they're 12 years old. So um, we need to grow in the Holy Spirit and he's available to us. If, if we are in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, not just with us to be our friend, but empowering our lives to be um, to be able to do what God calls us to do. If God calls you to do something, if he puts something on your heart to do, you know what? He will give you the power to do it, whatever it is. And we really see it in these two chapters. Two yeah, these are, the, the people are just amazed. These are uneducated people. They used to be in hiding, scared to death. And here they are out everywhere and saying, well, you're telling us to be quiet, and I'm sorry, we just can't do it. You know, that's basically what they're saying. So there's a, a marked change, and the change is the coming of the Holy Spirit into their hearts at Pentecost. So let's m move into Acts 4, and let's see if we can... Um, and this is sort of in the middle of the story, if you recall. They... Um, uh, healed a lame man who was how old? 40, 40. 40. So just think about that, how miraculous that was. It's, it's miraculous when somebody is healed if they're lame at any time, but he was born that way. So for 40 years, his muscles have not worked in that in, to enable him to walk. And not only is he walking, but he is what? Jumping and praising the Lord. He's leaping. And he is so excited. And and so he is clinging on to Peter and John. I mean, you know, he is so grateful. And um, so Peter steps up and he preaches a sermon. And that's in uh, the end of chapter 3. And, you know, he's very forceful here. I mean, he uh, talks about... Um, um, has glorified, hit in verse 13, uh, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered up and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him, but you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. Who was that? Barabbas. Barabbas, okay. But put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. So, I mean, he comes right out and he says, you know, you're the ones who murdered him. I mean, that's a real boldness, isn't it? And uh, so then he calls them to repentance there at the end, beginning of verse 19. And um, uh, and verse 25, he said, It is you who are the sons of the prophets. In other words, they're Jews. He's talking to people who are Jews. And he says, It is you. In other words, you've had the voice of the prophets. You've had the covenant of God. You've had the history of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all of that. You've had the feast. You've had the sacrificial system. You've had all of this. And of the covenant which God made with your fathers and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first, 
the word goes out first to these Jews because they've had a background of knowing God, supposedly. For you first God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. So he's calling these Jews. Now, in saying for you Jews first, the implication is that there's maybe somebody second after the first, right? And so what we're going to see, the pattern throughout the book of Acts is that whoever it is goes to the Jews first, and then when they reject, to the Gentiles. That's the pattern. Okay. So now, as a result of that speech, were they saying, oh, how what a nice speech. No. They were greatly disturbed. <laughs> yes, being greatly disturbed. Now, I, I'm going to do something here. Where this is a little bit, and this will take a few minutes, but um, I have another handout for you. And um, don't you love the different colors? Um, so that we can all keep straight, which handout uh, you're getting. And this one uh, has to do with the political parties in the days of Jesus. The various different uh, groups. I'll wait just a minute till all those get around. And as, as some of you know, we, we have the, the Pharisees and the um, Sadducees and the Zealots. You remember one of Jesus' disciples was a Zealot? The Herodians. Now, we don't know anything about the Essenes in the New Testament. We don't, they're not mentioned, but I've got them on the list. So the way this is organized, I wanted to um, contrast for you the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So you're going to see that um, in those two columns. And then in the, the, um, this column over here, I've just listed the other primary political parties um, so that I could have them all on the one sheet. But I didn't want to go into as much detail about them. Um, the two main groups that we read about, we talk about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now I'll tell you how you can remember it. Does anybody know? Yeah. They, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection and that's the reason they're sad, you see. Okay. So you can always remember that about the Sadducees, that they didn't believe in the resurrection. And you see in this uh, chapter here, the Sadducees mentioned there in verse 1. And one of the things, of the, the um, let me just go through some of this. Uh, the Pharisees meant the separated ones. They um, were very legalistic in their interpretation of the law. And you all know this. Jesus had conflicts with them a lot in, during his lifetime uh, over such things, as, especially over the observance of the Sabbath. Remember Jesus healed the uh, people on the Sabbath and they had a fit over that because you weren't supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. And they were really big on um, uh, defining the law. Because the Old Testament basically said you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And so they wanted to fill in the, in the blanks on exactly what did that mean. Exactly how far could you walk, because after all, walking is work. And exactly what you could do and what you couldn't do on the Sabbath. And so there was a lot of conflict over that. Remember the disciples were traveling one day and they picked some grain and they rubbed the grain, which was legal to do. They didn't have hardies on every corner and so... Um, if you were traveling somewhere, you were allowed to go and, and get some grain from the side of the road and eat. you weren't supposed to put it in your pocket and take it with you, but you were welcome to eat whatever you needed along the way. But it was a Sabbath and they were milling grain because they did this in order to eat something. Um, and you remember the healings on the Sabbath. And so Jesus had a lot of conflict with the Pharisees over that. In fact, the, one of the important things to see is that the Pharisees, uh, Jesus had more conflict with the Pharisees in his life, and the young church had more conflict with the Sadducees. 
you will see the Sadducees mentioned. Now, the reason for this, um, and let me just give you a few um, di differences. They believe, the Pharisees believed that the entire Old Testament was authoritative. That included not only the Torah, which is the first five books of our Old Testament, but also included the Psalms and Proverbs, all that literature, and also included the prophets. That was authoritative for them. The Sadducees only took the Torah. So they didn't uh, go along with the, um, uh, the, the rest of the literature. Um, the Pharisees also believed they accepted the written law, which we just talked about, the Torah, the wisdom literature, and the prophets, but they also thought that the oral traditions were important. And these were like commentaries on that that had been written through the ages. And so they had this vast wealth of tradition as well as the actual law that they thought was authoritative or important. Um, so that they have there, they accepted the written and the oral law. And you see a lot of times they, they will say something about the traditions of the fathers, something like that in the, in the uh, Gospels, you see that. Uh, they believed in life after death. They believed in the resurrection of the body. They believed in divine uh, retribution and reward. They believed in demons and angels. Um, but they were very concerned with uh, keeping the rituals. Now, there was a, a, a bit of a difference here because I have there, they were developers of the oral tradition, all the commentaries and the expansion of the law, or the um, detailed explanation of the law, which then they determined was more law. Um, they were the ones who established and controlled the synagogues. Now, the synagogues were in each town. Uh, they had been developed during the Babylonian era, when they were in exile in Babylon, and because they didn't have a temple to go to worship. And so they said, well, gosh, we need something. And so they developed the synagogues. And, you know, Jesus went in the synagogues, remember, and he would expound to them the law. Different uh, people would do that. So um, that's a little bit about the Pharisees. The Sadducees... Yeah, I think you had to have uh, ten Jewish men... Uh, to establish a synagogue. And so if you had 10 Jewish men, you would, it would be like a small group. Mm -hmm. But then they got bigger, and you know, a town would have one, like uh, I remember when we were in uh, Capernaum, we went and we saw where the synagogue was, this big building with columns and everything. Uh, so, you know, the, a, a town would have one, they might have more than one, I don't know. Well, you see that that church that they've been worshiping in all these years. Think about what you had to go build just to go to church. You know that. that oh, the temple. Well, yeah. that was. Um, but you know they didn't go to church like we go. You know we think of going to church mm -hmm. and we have some prayers and songs and a mm -hmm. sermon. We we are big on the sermon. Mm -hmm. um, that place was strictly for the purpose of sacrificing the animals for forgiveness. Um, and so like on Passover, they would go and the animal would be sacrificed. Then where did they celebrate Passover? In their homes. Oh yeah, in their homes. And so you can see how they, anyway, that's where the, Phar the Pharisees were, you know, big on the synagogues and that's where they had power was in the synagogues. The Sadducees were from, descended from the priestly tribe. And they were um, usually aristocrats. Um, they were descendants of the, if you see their members, descendants of the high priestly line. They believed in only the Torah. Now think about it, they were priests. And the Torah dealt with the priestly part. How to do the sacrifices, the meaning of the sacrifices and all that. That's all they were interested in emphasizing. So they opposed the oral law, and they, they were actually very materialistic, though. 
Uh, they denied life after death, so they denied the resurrection. So this is where, in, in the in Acts, they they're going to really jump on the disciples because the, what are the disciples saying? Jesus is raised from the dead, and so they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So they are there's going to be big conflict here between the Sadducees and the early church, and that's the reason. The um, Sadducees were in charge of the temple. They were priests. They were descendants of the priests. And um, they had a lot of political control through the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the group of 70 Jewish elders who um, made the laws, made the decisions. Because in Israel at that time, religion and politics were the same. It was all controlled by the same. So they, they tended a little bit towards Hellenism. That means the Greek influence. You know, there was a lot. I've been, um, uh, because my foot's been bothering me, I, I, I got a recumbent bicycle um, to use up in my, I can't walk in the neighborhood right now. So I've got this recumbent bicycle. And so I've got these videos of Israel by helicopter and it tells you about um, all these different places and I've been looking at all these places in, in the Holy Land you know for my 30 minutes every day and um, so anyway I, I've been watching all this but all these um, um, synagogues I've seen you know the ruins of the synagogues and stuff but um, also in the Holy Land at that time because of the Romans coming in um, you know the Romans just a you know, they were great warriors and builders, and, you know, they didn't have any culture. And so when they took over Greece, they said, hey, look, they have really good culture. We'll just take their culture, okay? And so they took over their culture. So when you go, you can go all over the, all over that whole area. You can go from Great Britain down to Egypt and anywhere in between, and you're going, wherever the Romans had influence, you're going to see a theater, you're going to see a, uh, a lot of coliseums, you're going to see um, baths, they were big on baths, you're going to see aqueducts, you see it everywhere you go, all there. And you see a lot of those, um, as I'm looking down from the helicopter, um, while I'm pedaling away, um, you, you see a lot of that influence. And so this is what the Sadducees were kind of the, uh, among the leading political leaders of the day, and so they were tending, you know, there were some syncretism was happening in their lives. They leaned a little bit towards Hellenism. Now, the Herodians were the ones who um, were very wealthy, and they were politically influential, and they were kowtowing to everything Herod said. And Herod was the king who had been appointed by Rome. He was really not even a Jew. Um, and, and he ruled, and um, they, ex the Herodians just, they went um, head over heels for Hellenism and um, syncretism. Um, the Zealots were an extreme party of the Pharisees, and they uh, were really opposed to Rome, and they were willing to... Um, commit acts of terrorism against Rome. And one of Jesus' disciples had been a zealot. They refused to pay taxes, and they didn't even want to use the Greek language because they wanted to use uh, Aramaic or uh, language, uh, their own language. And then the Essenes were the ones, you know, they were the ones that we, uh, where we got the Dead Sea Scrolls for them. And they were a wilderness group, and they just withdrew from life and went out into the wilderness and established their own community uh, with rigid adherence to the law. And then they had some of their own laws, too. It says other literature is authoritative. They had other uh, texts that they uh, looked at and examined. In fact, among the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's um, some in the Hebrew Bible, but there's other literature that they found in there, too. Um, they believed in um, the immortality of the soul, but not in a bodily resurrection. They were apocalyptic, in other words, looking towards the end times um, in their vision. They l lived in community with one another, and they didn't believe in marriage for themselves. They, they didn't say everybody should. Hmm? 
mean, were they a type of mountain lion? Uh, no, uh, not necessarily. Um, although they were, they were very strict, but they lived to themselves. They didn't. Um, they went out to the wilderness and lived in the caves and and lived as a group. Uh, they didn't want to have anything to do with the corruption. They particularly um, denounced the. I don't know if I put that on there or not. They denounced. Yeah, they rejected temple worship. They rejected everything the Sadducees were doing in the temple. They rejected that because they saw that as corrupt, and so they um, they didn't believe in all that. They sort of had an alternate sacrificial system um, because they thought that the temple worship was so corrupt in the time of Jesus, and it was. Remember Jesus threw out the money changers. You remember? So, does this help you a little bit? Yeah. You can look on there. But so that lets you know why. Basically, the people that tried Jesus and had him crucified, a lot of them were Pharisees. But the Pharisees didn't have as much problem with the early church as the Sadducees did because the Sadducees were very opposed to the resurrection. And here come these disciples and they say he's raised from the dead. And, you know, somebody goes around saying that and you don't believe in that. I mean, um, what can you say? Against that, I mean, it's it, it, it's terrifying for them. To Say think, a little uh, bit more about Hellenism. Is that specifically from the Greeks? Well, when the um, when the Romans took over Greece, they accepted their culture. They accepted their language. You know, Greek was a common language in. And somebody was uh, commenting on this early today. You know, in Galatians it says that when the fullness of time came, Jesus was born of the virgin or something. I think it's, uh, we found that verse for you. Because this is a really important verse for us to know. Um, I think it's Galatians 4.4. 4. Yeah. The Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the fullness of the time came... God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So he, 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 Jesus came to the Jews because God had prepared the Jews. They understood about the one true God. He had shown them through various things all through the Old Testament of what his coming would be like, although when he came they didn't understand it. But So God came through the Jews, but God had everything else in the world arranged so that the gospel could spread. And a lot of that was because of the Roman Empire. Because they had wonderful roads. that You could travel freely between countries. <clears throat> Any of you who went to Europe before they had the, European, the Euro... Now, how di just one little thing, how difficult it was. Every time you went from one country to the other, you had to show your passport, get a stamp, go through that line. Then you had to change all your money out. because. And so if you, you tried to time it right so that you just ran out of your money before you left that country and went to the next one, it was a big hassle. How much easier it is to travel now and you just use the same currency throughout. Of course, now you just swipe a card. Um, but... During that time, you could travel freely, one country to the other, no problem. There was, they called it the Roman peace. There was peace in the Roman Empire. I mean, they had slaves and they had a strong military and so forth, but there, was not, there were not a lot of wars going on. So they had wonderful roads, the travel was great, and they, uh, the Greek language was universal. So when the New Testament came out, it was written in Greek, not in Hebrew. And it meant that the, the whole then known world could, could read it. If they could read, they could read it. So um, there were a lot of things that had to be right for Jesus uh, to come. But along with that, the Jew, Joanne, you ask about the Hellenism, the Jews, the, when the Romans came in, they built their roads and aqueducts and those things were good, but they also built their temples <laughs> Lots of ru uh, ruins of Roman temples in Israel. They built the um, uh, 
theaters. Uh, they built um, all kinds of Roman structures like that for worship and the baths. The baths were another big thing. You can see the baths everywhere you go. You can go up to the border between England and Scotland. It just amazed me. I, I, Hadrian's Wall, you can go up there. And they had the most sophisticated bath system. I mean, it was, there were barbarians up there. It was horrible. But they had their Roman culture up there right on Hadrian's Wall in between England and Scotland. All the way down. You go down to Egypt and you can see Roman stuff. So, it, it you know, it's phenomenal. Okay. Did that answer your question? So they, they brought it. The, the, um, the Greeks had, you know, you all studied when you were in high school. Uh, they had great philosophers. They had playwrights. You know, so they had theaters for plays. Um, and then the Romans added their great engineering capabilities and took it everywhere in the world. Yeah. So, um, and so there were a lot of people in Israel who did not want to see. There was a conflict between the Hellenism that was coming in with the Romans and uh, the Jews who, who were not compromising with the Romans. Okay, so that's the reason you're going to see the Sadducees very important in this part of the biblical story. Sadducees. They're sad, you see. They don't believe in the resurrection. So they are very upset with these these uh, uh, apostles and, and other different people. That it says they were greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And so what did they do? They were powerful. They had political power. What did they do? And they didn't have due process, you know, they didn't have to read them their Miranda rights or anything like that. Uh, and so it said it was late in the day, so they just put them in jail and kept them there overnight. And, um, or so they thought. Well, this is the first time. Okay. This is the first time. Um, and it says, but many of those who had heard the message believed. And believe is going to be one of our repeated words throughout Acts. Uh, the importance of believing. And we'll, one week we'll talk about um, believing in more detail. But you know, we think of believing as being um, as being mental agreement, as if we can. Uh, separate our mind, our thinking, from the rest of us. And that is a very Western thought, a very Greek thought, that you can separate your thinking from the rest of who you are. And Jews don't think like that. Eastern thought. You don't, you can't separate your mind from your body and from your emotions and so forth. And so to believe something is to put your whole being into it. It's not just to agree with it. Like, you know, I can look over there at that chair and I can believe there's a chair over there and that's real nice. But if I want to really see if it's a well-built chair or not, I could go sit in it and make sure it's really going to hold me up and do what a chair is supposed to do, which is have a person sit in it. Um, and so that's sort of the difference between just mental agreement with something and putting your whole life into something. And, and so that's a, a, a difference in what the word believe means. Uh, and we have a lot of people today who say, oh, I believe in God. You know, I believe that a God exists. Does that mean that they believe in God? See the difference? Putting your whole trust, staking your life on it, living your life in such a way that it says, I believe in that. Not just mentally saying, oh, yeah, well, that's good. But not letting it have an impact on the rest of you. So many of them were believing. They were not just mentally agreeing, they were putting their lives on, on the line. They were 
living their lives in that way. Nancy, weren't they filled with the Holy Spirit? I'm thinking that's what brought it all together. I mean, the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit's just filling them. That's right. And when they when they initially believe in this resurrection that's proclaimed, and then they are baptized, then the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins. Then the Holy Spirit comes in. And they understood that. They were seeing it modeled by other people. And they lived that way. And so uh, they lived their whole life uh, according to that. And it was just spreading. Because look at here. Now there's 5,000 of them. 5,000 men. So there were more than that because we're going to see about some women too. So then they come before the... Um, now, let me just look at verse 5 a minute. Their rulers, it says that they came before the rulers, the elders, and the scribes. Um, the rulers would be the priests. And then the elders would be lay people who were Sadducees. And the scribes, the scribes would be like lawyers, and so they were Pharisees who were interested in expounding the law and writing it up and saying, you know, exactly how far you could walk, what all the legal technicalities were, what those words meant. They were scribes. So they were of the Pharisees. Well, those are the ones that could read and write, the scribes. Well, I, literacy was very high among all the Jews. Um, I don't know exactly what it was, but I mean... They all went to school, and they, and they and they learned uh, more so than a lot of other cultures. The Jews were always very interested in people being able to read and understand, and they had an oral tradition where they taught people, you know, memorization. So they were all gathered together in Jerusalem, and remember the first week we talked about the uh, commission given in chapter 1 let's go back there and just look at that I think it's verse 8 yeah. verse 8 you shall receive power when what man when the Holy Spirit has come upon you this is Jesus talking to them and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the remotest part of the earth and we are seeing that Acts is divided. First, there's the ministry in Jerusalem. Then it expands to Judea and Samaria. And then to the remotest part of the, of the then known earth. All the way to Rome is where um, Acts ends. So we are still in the Jerusalem part of the ministry. And you see here they were gathered in Jerusalem. So we're going to be noticing uh, where these events are occurring. And then they talk about all these different people who Annas, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas. Caiaphas had been the high priest. Now, in the Old Testament, the high priest was um, was a lifetime job. You became high priest, and you were supposed to be high priest until you died. Supreme Court. Yeah. Well, yeah, sort of like the Supreme Court. Um, but in the time of Jesus, within this high priestly family, they just, it became a political thing and they just passed it back and forth among them. And so there are several high priests living at the same time. Some of them were former high priests. And so Annas was the high priest, but Caiaphas, and then John and Alexander, they're not sure who John is, but Alexander was another person who was a high priest at a different time. Um, Annas was high priest from um, uh, uh, six, Jesus, he? Yeah, he was 6 to 15 AD and then Caiaphas was from 18 to 36, so I'm not sure but they went back and forth, and they were all considered, um, their opinions were highly regarded. So, the Sanhedrins um, were. The Sanhedrin was mostly made up of Sadducees. 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 Mostly Sadducees, because they were the high priests. 
Didn't I preach wear all those robes and well, tassels? And the, and the, um, the Pharisees did too. And so they, they are having court, basically. They bring these guys in before their council, which would be the Sanhedrin. And uh, they say, by what power or in what name have you done this? So they asked the question. And so Peter, it says, and whenever Peter speaks, it, it says he's filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, he, ma he makes a speech. So, you know, whenever, and remember Jesus had told them, you know, you're going to be called before courts. And when you come, don't worry about what you're supposed to say. How are you going to know what to say? The Spirit, the, whole, the Spirit will give you what you need to say at that time. And he, and so he says, rulers and elders of the people. He's very polite. Uh, starts off, and um, he says, if we're on trial here today, because we hit, we did a good thing for this man who's been lame for forty years, um, and that word in the very end of verse nine. Just to let you know, I thought this was interesting. It's the same word that's used down at the very end of verse 12, which is saved. So to save somebody and to make them well, healing and salvation are the same word in the Greek. So they have translated made well, but it's actually the same word as saved. Um, have they saved him? Yes. Yes. My Bible says healed. Yeah, well, that mine has made well, mm -hmm. but it's the same word. The Greek word is the mm -hmm. word for save. Well, it surely would save me if I had been a cripple for 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then he says, and let it be known to you and to all the people of Israel, it's because of Jesus, that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, he gives the whole name. And then he kind of, I mean, this is dangerous. You crucified him, but God raised him from the dead. Well, can you imagine how that went over with the Sadducees? Well, so he's not afraid to say the controversial here. By this name, this man stands here before you in good health. Now, there, this puts the Sadducees in a real pickle, doesn't it? I mean, here's this man, and was he well known to the people? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody knew him. Years. He had been sitting there at the same place. The family brought him and sat him down there. And every day they'd all gone in and out. He'd been there for probably at least 30 years doing that. And so they all knew him. And it was an undeniable miracle. It wasn't like it was somebody they'd never seen before. And they thought, well, maybe he really hadn't been lame before or whatever. This guy had been lame for 40 years. And now all of a sudden he's in good health. So sort of hard to deny that, right? Mm -hmm. And here come these guys and say, well, this same Jesus who healed him is raised from the dead. It flies in their face. And so, and then he goes on and he quotes scripture. Scripture that they knew. He says, he is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the very cornerstone. You rejected this guy, but he is the cornerstone. Now, what's the significance of a cornerstone in a building? It's crucial. It's the most important. Okay. How many of you all have done cross stitching? Well, you know, if you do counted cross stitch, you usually find the middle of your fabric, and you find the middle of your pattern, and you put that first stitch there. And actually, every other stitch in that pattern is based on where you put that first stitch. That, that, that would be the cornerstone. Y'all, can y'all relate to that? Yes. So what happens, you get down here over in the corner and you, and you, you're messed up, right? Have you ever had that happen? <laughs> get over here and you're supposed to be five to the left and you're four to the left or whatever. Um, so uh, that's what a cornerstone is. And the building that's being built is the house of God. We're talking spiritually speaking here. And remember, um, then let me give you a few extra um, 
scriptures. Did I give y'all any scriptures from here? Okay, yeah. Um, First Peter, and Jesus quoted this scripture. I gave you that in uh, Luke. It's the same thing in um, Matthew. Um, but then let's look at First Peter um, two. The same same scripture, the same concept. Uh, and First Peter two verse four, and coming to him as to a living stone, rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God. And you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He's talking about a spiritual temple, mm -hmm. house of God, that is being built here. And Jesus is the living stone rejected by men. So we've got to think out of the box a little bit here because this is not a rock. It is a rock. He is a rock, but he's a living rock. He's growing. Um, but we are living stones built on the foundations. We'll read that in... Uh, Ephesians, so that we can be a holy priesthood. So we're the stones and we're the priesthood in this house to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Just like in the tabernacle or in the, in the temple, um, sacrifices were offered. Now um, Jesus has offered the sacrifice for sin, so that doesn't need to be done anymore. But do we offer up sacrifices of praise, of gifts, of our talents, giving our talents to maybe go over and read a book with a poor child and at Neighborhood Focus? Or maybe going over to Hollis? Or maybe serving or getting the communion ready for Sunday worship here? Or singing in the choir? Or teaching a Sunday school class? Are those sacrifices yeah. unto the Lord? Those are spiritual sacrifices. So he's building up a temple, and Jesus is the cornerstone. Turn back to Ephesians. Y'all thought we were studying Acts, didn't we? <laughs> Ephesians 2.19 mm -hmm. So he's, he's talking to Gentiles here and he's talking about um, those who were uh, mm -hmm. unaccepted. The Gentiles are now brought in. And he says in verse 18, For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. He's telling that to Gentiles. Having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being what? The cornerstone. It's all in relation to him. In whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. So you and I now, all these centuries later, all these millennia later, are a part of this living and growing temple, and God is trying to fit us together, our pieces together. You know how the rocks have to be chipped off a little bit so that we fit? And, um, no mortar in the temple. No mortar. We have to fit. And sometimes we have to have a little piece ch chunked off you know, so we fit in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is among us and within us. Very, and, and we forget about the corporate importance of these things. So, that's what he says to those people. Well, how do you think they're going to respond? 
the Sadducees. If you were a Sadducee, how would you respond? I'd be in trouble. Okay, Ann said it. I'd be insulted. Yeah. But they, they're observing. See, they're in a pickle here. They're observing the confidence of these guys, and they said that, you know, they realized that these were uneducated men. I mean, these Sadducees had been to school. They had been to all the highest seminary training you could think of. And here are these guys who just come in, and they, they have this power and this confidence, and they, have, they, they recognize that they've been with Jesus. And then they saw that the, the, apparently the healed man was there with them. I don't know if he spent the night in jail or he just was there. Um, he just seems to be hanging around. Well, he, he said he was clinging to them, and I would be too. Um, and so then they decided that they needed to confer among themselves, so they sent the guys out. And he says, what shall we do with these guys? They are in a real quandary here. Mm-hmm. And so they warn them. They say, you know, don't talk about this stuff anymore. Don't even speak this man's name. I'm ad-libbing a little bit here, but you all get the idea. And they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And so Peter and John, how do they respond? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No. Is that what they say? No. Now, what do they say? Jail for yourself. So, so then they didn't know what to do because these guys said they're not going to do what they say. And so they threatened them again and then um, they let them go. And so then these guys go back to their group, to their prayer group, and they have a prayer. And this is it. And one of the, one of the commentaries... Um, I read, I, I can't believe this, it said in verse 24, they talking about they lifted their voices to God with one accord. And they said, oh, in order for them all to have said the same prayer, it had to be some memorized prayer or something, but can one person pray and everybody else is praying the same prayer in their hearts? Yeah. 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 What we're seeing here is once again, over and over we see this mentioned how they were all in one accord. They were all on the same page. They were all in agreement. We've had trouble with that, haven't we? Mm -hmm. And they loved one another. And look at their prayer. This is not what I would have prayed. My prayer had been something like this. Oh, thank you, God, for releasing us. Praise God, go on along with that line. And then I would say, Oh, Lord, keep them from persecuting us anymore so we can speak freely. Isn't that what you would have said? Sure, sure. sure. That's not what they said. They acknowledge that there's going to be opposition because they see that it's been foretold in Scripture. They look back at scripture and say, you know, when God's word comes, there's opposition. Why did the Gentiles rage? And all the people devised futile things. The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. They understand that there's going to be opposition from these people. And then they they say... They made the point that whatever they were doing against them was all a part of God's plan. They that, did. That's what they were doing. Thy purpose predestined. Verse 28. I like the first in that they're giving God, ador- they're adoring God. There's adoration there. Well, I would have adored God, but I would have adored God for getting me out of the council. But I thought that was neat that they did that first. Yeah, they did that first. Mm-hmm. And then what do they say? Then they ask God why these people are so stubborn and don't believe. Rage against him. Well, they understand that what is happening is a fulfillment of Scripture. And, and that it's the and that, that it's the way it's always been. Okay. That the word of God, when it goes forth, 
there's going to be opposition to it. Have you thought about that? This church proclaims the word of God. There is going to be opposition. There are going to be people who don't like that, who don't think First Press is a nice place, who think that we're... Holier than that. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Narrow-minded. <clears throat> or worse. Bigots. And what do they pray for? Protection? No, for great boldness. And to, to enable them yeah. to be able to do what they're being told they should do. <laughs> because it's God's will. I mean, I just love this prayer. Don't you think it's wonderful? Yeah. Don't you think it's really... Uh, show something about their heart yeah. and how grateful they are to God for forgiving them of all things past and filling them with his spirit in order to be able to do what he's called them to do. They trust God that he's going to provide the works they need, whatever it is they need. And then it, it talks again. We see that it says in verse 24 that they were with one accord. And we see in verse 32, and the congregation of those who believed, there's that word again, underline that word, were of what? Of one heart and soul. And they were living together in community. And they were generous with one another. If somebody had something and somebody didn't, they shared. The, the, with great power the apostles were witnessing to the resurrection in spite of the, fair, of the Sadducees there was grace upon all of them and here comes Barnabas we'll read a lot more about Barnabas that's the reason I think he's mentioned by name but he was a Levite from Cyprus what else did you learn about Barnabas? He sold the field and gave the money to the church. Put, put the money at the apostles' feet for it to be used however it needs to be used. And his name means, uh, he, he was uh, Joseph, but they named him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. We're going to see him encouraging people a lot throughout the Acts. Um, there's some discussion in some of the commentaries about why Barnabas owned land, because if he was a Levite, Levites didn't own any land right. uh, in the land, but maybe he owned some property over in Cyprus or something. I'm, I don't know. Huh. So or his anyway. wife owned it. Yeah, who knows? Because he didn't have to marry another Levite necessarily. Um, so then there's a contrast here between that, all of the oneness of the disciples. So, uh, and then we come upon this. Um, incident with Ananias and Sapphira mm -hmm. and you know they they saw what uh, Barnabas had done and other people too right, because it indicates that um, they were all giving for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sale but apparently there was not compulsion to do that it was a voluntary thing because um, when Peter confronts them, he says, you know, you had the land, you didn't have to give any of it to the church. You could have given part of it, but just said it was part of it. You didn't, you didn't have to claim you were given the whole thing. So apparently it wasn't communism in the sense we think of communism that was going on here. It was just that they were all living together and sharing, and if one person had a need, somebody else was sensitive to that need and sold something to give to them. It was voluntary. And um, so how did this story turn out? Not so well. Not so well. <laughs> it made a big point. You're going to be in the church. You better be honest and true. <laughs> do what you say you're going to do. And notice a couple of things about it. Um, first of all, it, it seems like a pretty harsh uh, Mm -hmm. judgment you know but in 
uh, in lying to the apostles and to the church. It's not called a church yet. It's called a church the first time in verse 11, if you want to mark that. Uh, but in lying to the church, in lying to the apostles, they were, the sin was that they were lying to the Holy Spirit. Um, I can remember one time, my daddy was a very, um, he was a strong believer and he was very um, uh, consistent in the way he did things. And one year he got audited by the IRS and they were auditing his charitable contributions. <laughs> I remember Daddy said he looked at the IRS agent and he said, you know, he said, I might lie to you, but I'm sure not lying to God <laughs> about what I gave. But um, so lying to, um, to lie to the church, I don't mean a structure, but to lie to the community of believers is to lie to the Lord. And it was serious. And there was a lot of excitement and joy and, you know, a lot going on here. There's opposition from the outside. And now there's a lot of, there's fear that comes upon, upon the group. There's still that love and everything. But there's some fear because we're dealing with holy things here. This is not just fun and games. These people lied to the one true God. And there's judgment in that. And so we see a little bit of fear come on. And, you know, um, we should fear God. I don't mean in the sense of scared to death. But we should understand the seriousness of our life in Christ. Um, he tells us not to fear the world or what the world can do to us, but we should fear God. And if we fear God, it's going to impact the way we live. We're going to realize the seriousness of our call to Christ and the seriousness of our walking with Him day by day. And when we know Him, letting what we know impact how we live um, but what generally happens is we usually fear those outside and we don't fear the Lord you ever notice that we fear what might what others might do to persecute us or to hurt us or to damage us but we should have reverence before the Lord and if we have true reverence before the Lord he's going to take care of those people out there but we get it backwards our natural thinking is to fear the opposition, and the real fear is fear from with, is would be this fear from within, not fearing the Lord. And so, you know, Ananias came in and they confronted him, and he lied and he fell down dead. And then they buried him before his wife even got back. I guess you know they wanted to get him out of the way. Yeah, they didn't want him to. You know, they didn't want people mourning over him. Uh, and then Sapphira comes in and they give her the opportunity to tell the truth mm -hmm. and she doesn't and so the same thing as I said the people who came in for your husband are coming in for you lady and um, and then it says it's kind of interesting and verse 11 and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things and that that is the occasion for the first use of the word church And then the next paragraph tells us once again about their oneness, even in spite of this thing with Ananias and Sapphira, their oneness. Um, it says here that they were in one accord in Solomon's portico. That's a part of the temple. And so they were apparently, con they still considered themselves Jews. And so they were going like the Jews have um, a prayer three times a day at the temple and that sort of thing and they were going and participating in those things together but they were still going they were Jews who believed in the Messiah that the Messiah had come and um, then it says in verse 14 something that I think is interesting multitudes of men and women and we're going to see you know 
Uh, Luke is very interested in women. Uh, he has a lot of things in his gospel about women, but he mentions the women a lot in this early story. So I'm going to be looking at that throughout. And they were constantly being added, so they were still growing. So they were unified, they were sharing, they were uh, caring of one another, and they were growing. And they were heal having a healing ministry, right? Yes. I guess they got George Moore to come, right? <laughs> and develop their healing ministry. And uh, people were kind of... Um, they thought just the presence of Peter would, would heal them. And many people, and they were um, people were being healed. And those afflicted with unclean spirits were being healed. But, I always look at the word but. A little <coughs> word with a powerful meaning. But, the high priest, including who? The Sadducees. They were full, filled with jealousy. And so they lock the apostles up in jail. And what happens? Don't wow. y'all think this is a funny story? Don't you love this story? So they lock them up and the angel lets them out. And so they, they get up real early the next morning. They go up to the uh, temple to preach. And then what happens? The council goes in and they say, bring the guys in. And they say, well... We can't find them. They're not here. You know what? They're up at the temple preaching. They said, Shoot, we just told them not to preach. <laughs> They're doing it again. And so um, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So, and of course, that's what they're really worried about, isn't it? Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Is that if this is true, that this Jesus has been raised from the dead, then they were responsible for killing him. And then Peter just responds by saying, you know, we've got to um, obey God rather than men. Now, through the centuries, you know, Paul tells us to obey the authorities, right? Mm -hmm. But they're not obeying the authorities. So, how do how do we um, determine when it's okay to uh, disobey the authorities and when it's not okay to disobey the authorities? Because Paul tells us, you know, we're supposed to pay taxes, yeah. and Jesus said, "Give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's." So we're supposed to pay our taxes. That means we're supposed to abide by the speed limit, ladies. Mm -hmm. uh, we're supposed to abide by the law. We're supposed to be... And you know, through the centuries, uh, most uh, l leaders liked having Christians because Christians, by and large, uh, obey the law. Except there's one law that they don't usually obey. They can't keep their mouths closed about Jesus. And they were directly obeying God because the angels told them to go. They were. Yeah. They and had Jesus had told them to be, what was the thing he told them? Be witnesses. my witnesses. So they're doing the thing that God has told them to do. They That's knew right. they had that authority. Yeah. And so then. Um, He is the one, verse 31, who God exalted to his right hand. So they're going to tell them. You know, and I'm sure the Sadducees were over there. Don't tell us about that. We don't believe in that. We're witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And so they were upset by what they heard. And so, how are we going to get out of this without them killing these apostles? Well, so, they have a meeting and Gamaliel speaks and, you know, tries to calm them down. You know, if this is, if this is what God has planned, that's what it'll be. If it's by man, it'll fail. And he, he was able to convince them. To and who was he? 
a great a great teacher and he taught Paul. He did. He was Paul's teacher, although Paul didn't quite go along with this at first. But he was a Pharisee. But he was well respected as a teacher of the law. And he gave a couple of examples from history of the last several years of people that had tried to rebel against the authorities and then uh, once they died, uh, everything just fizzled out. And so then he gives the advice that Miriam says, you know, it, uh, if, this, if this man is just another person who rebels, if it's just an earthly thing, he'll, it'll just fizzle out. But you need to be careful here, he says to him, because you could be crosswise to the plans of God. And they listened to his advice. But, sort of listened to it. It says they took his advice, but then what did they do? Flogging. Now, a flogging is not like, um, I mean, this was a, a hard beating. And we don't do anything like that today. This flogging is the same thing that happened to Jesus before he went to the cross. And, and people were killed with floggings. Um, and so how did they, uh, after they were flogged, this terrible beating, how did they respond? They rejoiced. Mm-hmm. Rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the cross. So, what do we learn from these two chapters today? Listen to the Holy Spirit. The gospel message is growing even in spite of the Sadducees. And these people, full of the Holy Spirit, are doing extraordinary things. They're just average run-of-the-mill people. They don't have a super seminary degree or anything like that. And they are living in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to use the expression that they are living for God. Because that's not what they're doing. They're living in the power of His Spirit within them. And I think that's what we need to pray for ourselves and for our church today is that God will raise us up to be full of His Spirit, to be His people, wherever we are, wherever we go, whatever our daily tasks, wherever they take us, that we we will be His his women, full of His Spirit, ready to proclaim who He is. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving us this portion of your word. I pray for each one of us in here that we would be filled once again with your spirit. That you would draw us close to you so that we realize how um, we belong to you. And all that you have done to release us from the power of sin and how you have filled us with all the power actually that rose Jesus from the dead is at our disposal enable us to be powerful representatives of who you are in our world in our daily life bless us these next two weeks and make us a blessing. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Lord, next week or not other next week? Next week we will not meet. Because I'm going to send it and I couldn't get a replacement. So um, it'll be two weeks.